Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Iran unveils its advances in uranium enrichment. Jordanian teachers on strike take to the street for better pay. And survey suggests less than a third of Libyans want democracy. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Well, Iran has unveiled a number of nuclear achievements. They include loading domestically made fuel assemblies into the Tehran research reactor, a new generation of centrifuges, and a 50% increase in the production of 3.5% enriched uranium. In Tehran, fuel assemblies for 20% enriched uranium made by Iranian nuclear scientists were loaded into the Tehran medical reactor in the presence of Iran's President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. The reactor produces medicine for thousands of cancer patients. The fourth generation of centrifuges was also unveiled in the city of Natanz. They are speedier and made up of carbon fiber. Iran has also added 3,000 more centrifuges to the 6,000 centrifuges operating in Natanz nuclear facility. In Tehran, President Ahmadinejad criticized the Western powers for their attitude towards scientific progress of other nations. I think that the greatest treason the West has committed against mankind is what they have done to science. See how they acted regarding Iran's nuclear program, their propaganda, their discourteous behavior toward the Iranian people. They tried to stop us and check the progress of Iran. There were resolutions, pressures and propaganda. But they didn't get anywhere that way. Our youth scientists and experts went through all these hard times and foiled their inhumane designs. Ahmadinejad also held Iranian scientists for their achievements despite all the pressures. Ahmadinejad said Iran is ready to export its know-how to the IAEA member states without any political consideration. Well, to talk about Iran's nuclear advances, Fuad Zari joins us. He's a professor at the University of Tehran here in the studios. Fuad Zari, thanks so much for talking to us. Well, Iran unveiled its new advances, and of course this comes despite the U.S.-led sanctions, which means that the country should rely on its indigenous resources. How important are these new achievements? Um, I think Iran was uh, sending a signal that uh, it's not uh, going to uh, respond to pressure. Uh, it's not going to uh, basically um, listen to the U.S. government or the Israeli government and um, follow their uh, lead uh, in terms of uh, the country's national security. Uh, in the clip that you showed, the person who was making the announcement was actually the uh, father of uh, the last uh, scientist that was assassinated on Tehran streets uh, some weeks ago. And uh, that's a signal that um, I think the Iranian government is trying to send. The signal is that you can kill our sci uh, nuclear scientists, but you cannot uh, stop uh, Iran's nuclear program. The program is peaceful, and uh, Iran, uh, as we see, is going to continue with this uh, program and advance it. Uh, much more than before. So I think the message is that the more pressure you exert on Iran, the more uh, advanced Iran will get in this regard. And of course, uh, Iran and the P5 plus one, I'm sure you're aware, are due to hold a new round of talks. How do you think the talks are going to turn out? Are they going to be successful, given the, the advances now uh, as revealed by Iran? Yeah, I think the policy that the European governments, a number of them at least, and the U.S. government, the Israeli government have is that they want to increase economic pressure on Iran. They want to talk about the war against Iran and attacking Iran with the hope uh, that uh, Iranian government will change course and will listen to them in terms of uh, what, what needs to be done. must set red lines on the Iranian nuclear program. This from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who told the Knesset that the world must also condemn Iran for its recent attacks against Israeli diplomats abroad. Speaking at a Knesset meeting in honor of visiting Croatian President Ivo Yosipovic, Netanyahu called Iran the world's largest exporter of terrorism. 
The Prime Minister's statement on Tehran's disputed nuclear program came as the Islamic Republic announced that it will unveil a new generation of homemade nuclear fuel rods in the near future, intended for use at its research reactor in the Iranian capital. The nationwide general strike may now be behind us, but commuters and hospital patients are feeling the sting from yet another set of sanctions. Joining us now with the details from our Tel Aviv studio is IBA's Ariel Reshef. Good evening, Aaron. Well, nurses at Soroka Hospital in Beersheba and Barzilai Medical Center in Ashkelon walked off the job today in protest of what they see as unbearable work conditions. They are now operating on an emergency schedule only, and that has caused a shortage of unparalleled proportions. The hallways at the hospitals are filled with patients seeking care, and conditions are rapidly deteriorating. The nurses say that, they, that the overcrowding at both hospitals has topped a staggering 180 percent and that patients must wait hours for essential treatment. They claim that every department is at least five nurses short and are now demanding that wards be added to cope with the influx. The nurses claim that they are unable to properly serve their patients under the current circumstances, including some with life-threatening illnesses. They say that they are simply fed up with the reoccurring problem and vow to maintain their work actions until their demands are met. And now, Aaron, let's turn to the Israel Railways dispute. Employees have officially returned to work today, but train operations were delayed at the Herzliya terminal after an unconnected suicide attempt. The workers' union staged sanctions yesterday in defiance of a court order that required them to go back to work. In protest, Gila Edry, the chairwoman of the Workers' Committee, showed up hours late to the National Labor Court hearing on the issue. This prompted the court to hold union leaders in contempt and to slap them with heavy fines. The Labor Court also renewed its injunction against the Wildcat strike, but not before the work stoppage wreaked havoc on the country's rail system. The Israel Railways Union is protesting management's decision to privatize services in the industry. But in an apparent punitive measure for the union's behavior, the finance ministry is now saying that it will consider outsourcing even more of the railway services. Minister of Transportation Yisrael Katz and Hista Drut Chairman Ofer Aini are slated to hold talks tomorrow to discuss the grievances. But for their part, the workers' union says that it will resume, re resume excuse me, the strike if its complaints aren't adequately addressed. And one more note, Aaron, 400 of the nation's teachers working on partial contracts will now launch their own strike this evening. They're demanding additional pay and benefits. So just days after that crippling general strike, it looks like there are still plenty of unresolved work disputes. The protest movement in Jordan expanded to the education sector with thousands of teachers demonstrating in the capital Amman. The protesters have been on strike for nearly a week. They are demanding a salary increase. Their strike has prevented approximately 1.4 million students from going to class. The Jordanian street is once again seeing protests. This time, demonstrations were organized by thousands of school teachers who rallied in the capital, Amman. School teachers from various Jordanian provinces took part in the demonstration to protest the government's decision to cancel the bonuses it had previously promised them. Today, we're here to send a very strong message to the decision makers and relevant parties that the teachers are steadfast in seeking the legitimate rights they deserve. The teachers who participated in the demonstration rejected the government's claim to lack the money required to meet their demands. They demanded a strong policy to tackle corruption and bribes and recover the public funds that have been depleted by what they refer to as the great looting of the country's wealth. The protesters held the government responsible for their deteriorating living conditions as a large amount of the budget went missing due to the rampant corruption in the government. Why is it that while millions of dinars are being embezzled, when it comes to paying the teacher only 20 additional dinars, the government says it has no money and buries its head in the sand? I've been a teacher for 25 years and over the years I got a raise of two dinars, 59 piastres and some change. The strike has been ongoing since the beginning of the month, preventing nearly 1.4 million students from going to school.
This demonstration is part of the protest movement that the Jordanian street has been witnessing for several months and comes within the framework of a wider call for political partnership, public freedoms, fighting corruption and changing the country's internal and foreign policies. Libyans are getting ready to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the start of the uprising that turned into a revolution and ended with the killing of Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi and the downfall of his regime. Bloody fighting and tens of thousands of people were killed and injured in 2011. At the same time, Libya was marked that year by a new regime, government and rulers. So how do Libyans look at the past and the future? The British University of Oxford attempted to answer this essential question by conducting field research in Libya. This demonstration in Benghazi on February 15, 2011, sparked a Libyan journey that ended with a complete change of the face of the country. Bloody fighting, with the participation of international powers and the blessing of the Security Council, continued until October 20, 2011, with the killing of Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi in an unforgettable bloody scene. والآن بعد كل هذه الأحداث كيف يتطلع الليبيون إلى العام الماضي من جهة؟ And now, after all these events, how do Libyans perceive the past year? And how do they view the future? The British University of Oxford, with the cooperation of the University of Benghazi, conducted the first field research aimed at looking into the opinion of Libyans since the eruption of the uprising and following its victory. These are part of the survey's results. Libyans are most likely happy. The survey placed Libya in position 13 of 57 on its level of optimism, ranking ahead of France, the U.S. and Germany. As for the Libyans' position on the revolution, 82% are certain it was entirely good and 15% believe it was good but with less certainty. وعن أولويات الإنفاق في المرحلة المقبلة on spending priorities in the upcoming phase, 34% of Libyans believe health care should be the priority, while 27% prefer education. 17% chose infrastructure and only 8% chose environmental improvements. يفضلون الإنفاق على تحسين البيئة. And with political Islam highlighted in all Arab Spring movements, 49% of Libyans believe religion and politics are one. Only 21% view the two as completely separate. 30% of Libyans believe there is some link between the two. How do Libyans evaluate the role of the international community in toppling al-Qaddafi? 42% of Libyans acknowledge Qatar's role, 39% recognize France's role, 7% give credit to the U.S., and only 5% to Britain. And the same way some helped the Libyans in their uprising, there are forces that cooperated with al-Qaddafi. 60% of Libyans view Algeria as the top player among these forces. 14% believe Russia was the Qaddafi regime's main ally, and 6% point to China. The Libyans' optimism, as reflected in the survey, doubles the new regime's responsibility. The optimism that is not attributed to the reality often turns to frustration, and frustration turns to anger. Nasir Fragali, BBC. Syria's fourth largest city of Hama that has relatively remained distant from the revolution's mobilization woke up this morning to an attack launched by regime forces across various neighborhoods. Regime forces used armored vehicles and portable anti-aircraft artilleries in the attack. Activists said that tanks deployed near Hama Castle continued to shell the neighborhoods of Taraya, Eliat, Bashura, and Al Hamadiya. They added that regime forces were seen advancing toward the airport amid interruption of land and mobile phone services across Hama. 
the activists were unable to compile reports on the number of casualties. Politically, French Foreign Minister Alain Juppé said his country is discussing with Russia a new UN Security Council resolution that calls for the establishment of humanitarian corridors in Syria. In the Australian capital, Canberra, Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Ekmeddin Ehsanoglu, issued an urgent appeal to rescue the Syrian people. Meanwhile, the UN General Assembly is preparing to vote on a non-binding draft resolution condemning the crackdown in Syria. From the world's Far East region to its west, the Syrian events are the focus of diplomatic action. In New York City, the UN General Assembly is expected to vote tomorrow on a non-binding draft resolution condemning the crackdown in Syria. The draft resolution, which was submitted by Qatar and Saudi Arabia, highlights some of the points listed in the Arab League's initiative, most notably the cessation of violence and military operations and demands for a peaceful transfer of power. However, the resolution does not refer to the Arab League's request for the deployment of a joint peacekeeping force in the Syrian territories. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, said at the General Assembly that crimes against humanity are being committed in Syria. Damascus has strongly rejected the claim. In Washington, China warned against what it described as wrong steps by the UN Security Council that could worsen the bloodshed in Syria. This news comes after the US President and Vice President expressed disappointment over Beijing's veto of a UN Security Council resolution condemning violence in Syria two weeks ago. From the far south in Australia, Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Ekmel Adin Isanoglu, rejected military intervention in Syria and called for mounting pressure on the Syrian government to hold talks with the opposition. Everybody is against. Everybody is against this issue. We are definitely against any military intervention in Syria. The military operations in Iraq, Libya, Somalia and Afghanistan have further fueled the situation rather than solved conflict or helped the people. France, which was the first nation to call for humanitarian corridors to help the stricken people in Syria, said it will soon create a humanitarian emergency fund for Syrians in the amount of 1 million euros. The French foreign minister said his country will push for a UN resolution to establish the previously proposed humanitarian corridors. We are holding talks with Russia in order to reach a resolution at the UN Security Council. We hope to reach a vote at the General Assembly on a resolution, though it's symbolic, to say enough killing. These announcements came days before a meeting scheduled by a group called the Friends of Syria at the Tunisian capital in order to explore ways to help Syria end the crisis. On the ground, the shelling of homes and the military operations across the provinces of Hama, Idlib, and the countryside of Damascus continue. Government officials in Thailand charged two Iranians with carrying out three bombings yesterday in the capital Bangkok. They said it's too early to link the blasts to any international terrorist group. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held Iran responsible for the attacks and demanded an end to what he referred to as the Iranian aggression before it spreads to other countries. Iran denied any involvement in the Thailand blasts and accused what it called elements linked to Israel of attempting to harm Iran's relationship with Thailand. Thailand released these closed-circuit TV images of three people said to be Iranians suspected of involvement in the three bombings in the Thai capital, Bangkok. The incident began from this house, where an explosion took place. In the second bombing, one of the suspects, who holds an Iranian passport, appeared to be running and throwing a bomb at a police station. He was wounded in the explosion with severe injuries that led to the loss of his legs. The third blast took place in a nearby area. Besides the wounded man, another Iranian was arrested at Bangkok airport. 
Meanwhile, Thai police said a third suspect fled to Malaysia. All this was reported by official sources. The Bangkok government confirmed the two Iranian detainees were charged with carrying out a bombing in a public place and attempting to attack police officers and the general public. However, a source in Thai intelligence said the three Iranian suspects were an assassination team that attempted to target Israeli diplomats, including the ambassador, by attaching explosives to their cars. In a statement by the spokesman for the Iranian Foreign Ministry, Iran denied having any connection to the bombings and accused elements linked to Israel of trying to harm what it referred to as Iran's friendly and historic relationship with Thailand. Tehran offered to cooperate in uncovering the truth behind these bombings. The Thailand blasts occurred a day after the two bomb attacks that targeted employees in the Israeli embassies in India and Georgia. Has there been any proven link between the attacks? We believe the bombs used in these attacks are the same kind as those used in India. We are currently investigating whether the assailants belong to the same group. Israelis assert there is a link and resemblance between the attacks and they are accusing Iran of being behind them. As investigations are ongoing in Thailand, officials said a piece of magnet was found that bears resemblance to the magnet used in the Indian bombing and in the explosive device dismantled in Georgia. In Saudi Arabia, anti-regime protesters have held fresh rallies in the eastern province. They took to the streets in the city of Qatif, demanding the release of rights activists. They also called on international organizations to condemn human rights violations in the kingdom. Saudis have been holding demonstrations on an almost daily basis, defying the ban on protest rallies. They want political reforms and an end to the century-old Al Saud dynasty. The protesters are also angry at economic and religious discrimination in the kingdom. Several demonstrators have been killed and dozens of activists arrested since February 2011. Yemenis in the city of Taiz have once again staged mass rallies calling for the prosecution of outgoing ruler Ali Abdullah Saleh. They condemned the legal immunity granted to Saleh. They want the longtime ruler to be tried for the killing of anti regime protesters. Saleh has stepped down in return for immunity from prosecution under an Arab mediated deal. His forces are accused of killing some 2,000 people since the start of the revolution last year. Saleh is in the U.S. allegedly to receive medical treatment. He says he will return to Yemen to vote for the national consensus presidential candidate, Abdurrabu Mansur Hadi. The network of collaborators in Gaza is the Hamas movement's obsession in the Strip. Our colleague, new TV correspondent in Gaza, Mohammed Al Madhoun, reports. After the resistance patiently waited to attain it, this scene represents an image of victory for the movement that was conceded by the occupation. Hiding an Israeli soldier for five years in a tiny piece of land like Gaza forced the Israel Security Agency to admit to the horrible defeat it was subjected to by the resistance's ingenuity. The ongoing battle of the mind is an open war with no truce. It has become obvious that the resistance is superior to its enemy in this war. The Interior Ministry's top priority in the recent years has been to tackle what is known as the phenomenon of collaborators in Gaza. In reality, it is not a phenomenon. There's only a few of them. We took some stringent measures because even if there is just one collaborator, they're a danger to the Palestinian society. So the Interior Ministry uses a number of methods. It uses enticement and intimidation. Collaborators played a major role in the last war in Gaza, both on the ground and in terms of intelligence. This placed specialized government institutions, together with the resistance factions, in front of a task they must complete, and that is to uproot the collaborators as much as possible. For that aim, the Interior Ministry opened what it named the Door of Repentance to informers for two months. During this period, the ministry managed to gather information that helped capture a number of collaborator networks and discover new methods they've been adopting. 
There were a number of collaborators who turned themselves in, and they wanted a door of repentance so they can return to their people because they completely foiled the occupation's extortion. So it was a good opportunity for them, and in fact, some became double agents. In foiling collaborators, the occupation state first targets those who work in the border regions, such as farmers, workers, and fishermen. This videotape recorded by Al Quds Brigades, the military wing of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad movement, shows one of the spies trying to cross over the border fence. So the efforts to tackle spying is not only exerted by government institutions, but are also combined with the contribution of the resistance and civilians. The Hamas movement that governs the Gaza Strip does not hesitate to hand down death sentences against those who are convicted, despite the fact that the approval of President Mahmoud Abbas's is required. Abbas has refrained from signing, and there has been ongoing criticism by human rights organizations against such verdicts. And while these actions are viewed as a violation of public and private rights, the government says it is cleansing the society from a plague that has caused much harm. The network of collaborators who infiltrated Palestinian society has always been a source of problems that everyone tries to eradicate, or at least eliminate its effects. This goal was completed after the issue was brought to the attention of the public and after receiving the effort it requires. In turn, the occupation's bank of objectives went bankrupt, objectives the enemy attempts to meet regardless of the consequences in anticipation of the upcoming war that everyone is discussing. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.